our first question is typically background, but in your case, you've shared it on multiple interviews, so I'm not going to go there. Uh, instead, I'm actually going to go into one, which is there've been there seem to be quite a few defining moments uh, for you from when you left Accenture to start to to moving to a startup, from you, when you moved to the startup to um, you know to to becoming a VC. But I'd also like to understand sort of in a broader context, what are the big defining moments in life that spurred those ch- spurred those changes, um, and you know what what how would you rank them? Why did they happen? Um, okay, that's a that's a fair question and not one I get asked often. <laughs> um, well, let me start with uh, leaving Accenture, where I was for nine years and going to do a startup. I left in November 1999. I had been wanting to leave since probably 1995 or 96, and. Uh, It's a story I tell people, especially in colleges and universities all the time. Uh, My only regret in my entire journey is that I didn't start my journey younger. And not to discount the almost nine years I spent at Accenture. It was good. But I feel like I could have started uh, getting involved with startup activities earlier and I kept putting it off, and I put it off for all the wrong reasons. I wanted to find the perfect idea and the perfect team, and frankly, I was earning too much money, and the more money I kept earning, the more I kept thinking, can I really give this up? And luckily, I realized that if I put it off any further, the problem was just going to get worse because I was going to start making more money, and and you know, there's a term for that, it's golden handcuffs. And I feel sorry for my friends who stayed too long and made too much money. I guess that's kind of ironic to say. But, um, but I feel like they ended up in soulless careers. And I think they would even admit to that, to tell you the truth. And so making money and having a soulless career, um, nah, I, I don't think anyone ends up being happy with that. So that was the defining moment. Um, If you actually want to know it, and I've never told this story, I was sitting in a bathtub in Tokyo at a hotel, and I don't take baths often, so this is why maybe it's memorable, and I was reading a Wired Magazine article about a company called Akamai, and Akamai had just found it, no one had ever heard of it, and uh, they were describing this thing called a CDN, a Content Distribution Network, And I had been debating this exact idea as one of my startup ideas. And within a week, I jumped on a plane and flew to Boston and uh, met the founders. And I just found a way to get on their schedules and decided I wanted to go join that company. Uh, When I tried to negotiate with them, they wanted to hire me, but, but the terms that they wanted to hire didn't make sense to me. But after I had done that and had that taste of almost joining off of my, I said, okay, I got to get off my ass and go do this. And that really was the defining moment for me. That's great. So now the, the second question is, so there's a theme of a personal branding that I associate with you. Uh, you yeah. speak a lot about how you thought um, and then went about executing your idea of being the both sides of the table brand, right? And, yep. and it seems to have flown to your uh, to your company as well. You uh, rebranded from GRP to Upfront. So I, I think I have first a question from a company point of view, which is how different is this? It's the same people, uh, but it's a different name. H- how different is this? How different has it been practically? How different do you want it to be, right? Um, so that's kind of question one. And I think question two is more about this whole concept of personal branding. I think I'd love to understand what, you recommend people ought to do or ought to think about at least and what are the questions we need to ask because we don't it's not a topic often spoken about or talked about it feels almost too soft uh, but so, so so it'll be great to get your view from both of an organizational point of view as well as a person from a person's point of view i'm going to break those up into their two components first yeah. i'm going to talk about upfront ventures and then i'm going to talk about personal branding yeah upfront ventures um, you could argue that already we had started to change our firm. We had the name GRP, but GRP didn't stand for what we did. And it wasn't like we had some founders named Gordon, Rob, and Pete or something. You know, <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't mean anything that stood for us. 
Yeah. And really for me, in part it was how we were already operating, and in part it was aspirational. I felt if we were going to have a brand and define a set of values, uh, that ought to define how we want to behave. And in fact, if you put out in the marketplace where upfront ventures and you're not very upfront, people people call you out on it, right? Yeah, yeah. So in a way, kind of putting that brand was aspirational. Uh, but let me also say I'm trying to define a brand for 20 years, and 20 years means we're going to recruit a whole new group of people over the next 20 years, and there's going to be changes. And so we ought to set out our stall of what we want to hold ourselves to. Um, but I also would say to you, we added one new partner. His name's Greg Bettinelli. He comes from an operational background like myself. We're about to announce a second one next week. So watch this space. It hasn't been <laughs> announced yet. Um, I hope that announcement will come out Thursday, Friday next week. And, um, and then I've got another one in the works. Uh, we also are investing in a lot of infrastructure, and I, I basically told my investors, RLPs, that we were going to do this. We said, we're going to invest more of the money you give us in our community and in a platform and put less in our pockets. We're going to uh, set out to define what we hope to be the market-leading brand in Los Angeles. I think we've done that. Um, we are going to bring new staff in, new young blood. We hired four new associates in the last 15 months alone. Uh, and we are about to hire a couple operational people on our team to help us run a platform. So I feel like in part we've done it and in part it's aspirational. Mm -hmm. And the reason we changed is I wanted to hold ourselves accountable to how we feel we need to behave in the market. Right the, sec the second question you asked was about personal branding. Let me just say this. You are branded whether you like it or not. So the only question is, do you want to take control of it? Mm -hmm. Right? If you are an Indian kid sitting in Singapore, I don't know exactly your educational background. Let me say it's engineering or software or business or whatever it is. People are going to define you whether you like it or not. They're going to define you by your age bracket, by your education, by your ethnicity, by your geography. And all I'm saying is, given that people are going to define you anyways, wouldn't you like to take control of that? So let's look at me, and I've talked about some of this publicly. Yes. Um, you know, I, I graduated with a degree of economics, but I had been programming from 13 years old until 23 when I graduated college. And yet I graduated the degree in economics. So people had me pegged as business guy. And I didn't want to be pegged as business guy. I was interested in technology. And by the way, this is 1991. Technology wasn't in vogue yet. I truly was a geek. Uh, but I was a geek who threw keg parties. And so I wanted to be perceived as technical. It was important to me. Yeah. And the only way I could do that was to do more technical work. So within Accenture... I pushed for more than two years to get transferred into the technical part of Accenture yeah. just so people would take me seriously. Yeah. And, and it took a long time. But once I was in the technical part of Accenture, uh, it was called Anderson Consulting back then. Yeah. Uh, then everyone saw me as a tech geek. And I thought, hang on a second. Like, I've got business chops. I've actually done marketing. I've done pricing. I've done deregulation work. Um, and so you just, you get pigeonholed. People want to pigeonhole you and they want to define you. And I don't even think that's a bad thing. I think it's just human nature. So my recommendation to people is define where you want to be in five years or eight years. What do you want to be perceived as? And how are you going to get there? What is the journey? And the more you tell people politely and not seeming overbearing, but politely assert what it is that you are the more people will start to repeat it. I know it sounds dumb, but I promise you it's true. <laughs> and, uh, and, and of course, your, 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 your branding has to match somewhat reality. I can't define myself as an NBA basketball player. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm five foot 10, and that's on a windy day. <laughs> or my, my wife calls it Jewish 5'10". <laughs> Jewish 5'10". And, my my branding uh, to be an NBA player doesn't match with my actual skill sets. Th those are too far off. So so I do think reality has to come into this. 
but it is really important that you define the brand. And, and I just want to give you one more piece of advice that I was given when I was young. And this actually, you know, is something that you probably do naturally. I can tell you're wearing a nice shirt right now. It's seven in the morning, your time, and yet you're looking professional. I'm looking scrappy. Uh, I've got, just so you know, my uh, maker yes. t-shirt on. Yes. So I've reached a point in my career where it's acceptable and ironically sometimes important for me to dress down, not dress up. And yet for young people, dressing up a little bit is actually can give you credibility. So the, the advice I was given when I was young is always dress like the part one level above where you are, where you want to be. And that's part of people perceiving you as the next level up when you act and behave like that. Number two is when you're young, you always bring your manager's problems. You just, because it's so easy to spot the problems and you go and you say, this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong. So my cousin is 23 years old and she works for <laughs> Maker Studios. <laughs> So she says to me, Mark, you know, this is what's wrong and this is what's wrong and this is what's wrong. And I said, oh, okay, go do something about it. Like, why don't you go schedule a meeting with a bunch of people in your company and come up with solutions to some of our problems? And why don't you instead go to your bosses and say, you know, what? we thought about the problems our company has. Everybody knows what those are, but here's three ideas of how we could make things better. So part of personal branding is also living the brand because branding it can't be just what you apply to yourself you have to live it yeah and start living the brand you want to be one level above where you're at but i best stop talking and let you ask more questions <laughs> no that's perfect uh, in fact mark it was uh, a, a post you posted ages ago about um, how when you were a junior uh, somebody told you that you know don't just keep asking one question at a time put together a point sheet right and ask ask 10 questions all at once and some of them will even disappear so that's what got me started reading your blog so thank you so much for that thank uh, you so th the next one would be so you mentioned many many times like for example you drew the little matrix for uh, when you were describing salespeople you know with mavericks superstars etc and you said look sales i believe is is largely innate right and then of course there's some part that can be taught right so, so so there's that philosophy of i guess nature versus nurture that's coming in and you've mentioned that theme when it comes to leadership and comes to entrepreneurship so how does that influence you as a father uh, of two kids and then also you know as as somebody who's advising many a ceo right so how how much how important do you think is nurture so basically how important do you think these things can be taught and 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 how does that change the way you both parent and, and, and advise people? Well, if I say something is nature versus nurture, anyone who has kids, before you have kids, you believe that life in general is, I don't know, 70 to 90% nurture and 10 to 30% nature. And anyone after you have kids will tell you it's the exact opposite. <laughs> And kids <laughs> how they come out. Um, so there's no doubt in my mind that a larger portion is nature than we like to acknowledge, that it's DNA and that we're hardwired. Now, of course, we're all products of our environment and our upbringing. And, uh, you know, so for me as a father, it's important for me to encourage my kids to break the rules. Like I actually celebrate, I mean, my job as a father is to get them to follow my rules, <laughs> but I secretly applaud when they break the rules. And you know this probably from my blog, but one of my proudest moments was when my son went into a bakery with my wife and my wife didn't want to ask the people to slice up a cake to give him a piece of cake. She said, you need to order a piece of cake that's already cut. And he said, but I want the chocolate. And she said, but it's not cut. And his response was, well, why don't we ask him to cut it? And, you know, the parable for me is if you don't ask, you don't get. So my wife said, okay, if you want it, then you ask. So my son, you know, said to the lady, you know, could I please have a slice of chocolate cake? And the lady said, of course. And she went and cut it. And my wife just wouldn't have asked. And, uh, and she would acknowledge that too. She, she acknowledges that story. But I want to encourage my kids to um, not accept just what they're told in life in a polite, respectful way. 
Um, and that's very important to me. Um, and I think you can ingrain people uh, to learn right from wrong and to teach them good working practices. And it's the same as a CEO. You know, it, it's so much of it is lead by example. Um, you know, there's an old saying, and I don't know if I've written about this, but it says you praise people publicly and you reprimand them privately. Mm -hmm. And so if you're the kind of person that is always praising your best people in public to the whole company, and then when you're upset with someone, you pull them aside and tell them why, then other people in your company will model that behavior. And uh, so you can really teach people through good behavior. And of course, none of us are perfect, not myself included, but, but you know, there's a lot that can be taught. But what I've been asked in the past is, um, are there fundamental things that can't be fixed? And I just believe that's the case. And, and actually, uh, you know, I'll say this to you. Uh, another thing I haven't really talked about publicly is there's tools, two schools of thought with your strengths and weaknesses. Historically, we were taught when I was younger that you need to do an assessment of your strengths and your weaknesses, and you need to fix your weaknesses. Yeah. And uh, a new school of thought came out that said, actually, don't fix your weaknesses, play to your strengths. Yeah. I'm a much, much bigger believer in that. So over the years, I've realized, so on my sales matrix, I talked about innate sales skills and ability to follow a process. And I basically said, if you have really high innate sales skills, and you can follow a process really well, you will be a great sales leader. Mm -hmm. um, and those are the absolute superstars, but they're very rare. If you're like me and you have innate sales skills, but you're terrible at process, that's what I call the maverick. And mavericks make really bad sales managers. I, I was a bad sales manager, but I could close business. And then I said there were people who had really high innate ability to follow process, process but yeah. really low innate sales skills, yeah. I called them journeymen. Yeah. And journeymen and mavericks, are, the, the problem is that the journeyman just doesn't have an innate ability to sell, yeah. but they can follow the rules. And if you're great at process, go with process. If you're like me and you're not great at process, I think if I spend tons of my effort trying to be great at process, I'm going to uh, ruin my innate natural sales skills. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying do nothing to improve your weaknesses. That would be silly. But I just think spend more time catering to your strength. And what I do is because life is about working with other people, I always surround myself with people who are good at the things that I'm not good at. So because I'm terrible at process, you will not find me do anything with anybody where I don't have a good process person with me including my wife. So she's the process person in the Suster household. I see. I think I'll, 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 I'll quickly go on, uh, on one, one topic that you've spoken about a lot, right? Mentors. Uh, you, you mentioned from time and time again that you've had lots of mentors, both at GRP, Accenture, et cetera, who helped you out. So this was from a friend as an entrepreneur. He says, you know, life can be pretty lonely. How do you make sure you go out, seek and find and, and, and connect with mentors? Is, is this something you do or is this something that's purely happenstance? That is a great question. It would be nice to believe that there's a bunch of good people out there who just want to mentor young leaders. And they're out there, but if you want to sit around and wait for great mentors to come out and find you and offer themselves up, good luck. Um, I, I have two things that I recommend. Number one is the easy answer. You should form peer groups and get peer mentorship. And I did that um, when I was first time entrepreneur. I would simply have lunches and I would invite other CEOs and it would be private off the record and I always started by opening up first. Mm -hmm. So I would say things like, um, you know, we raised money at a $31.5 million valuation. We took 40% dilution and we had 2x liquidation preferences. And that wasn't very good. I'm trying to figure out how to do my next round. Should I do a down round? Should I do a flat round? Should I get rid of my liquidation preferences? Should I go try to raise a bunch of money? What should I do? And people were shocked that I was that open. And, you know, because people like protect all that information. But 
you know, so I would say, and then someone else would say, well, we don't talk about that publicly. And my response was, dude, I'm not a journalist, right? Like this is, I'm not writing this in, in the press. This is about us learning. And um, I felt that being open and being willing to talk to other people about what my issues were and then trying to solicit from them. And then you just find the table actually discusses things. Um, and uh, that's the best way. And frankly, you, you know, I, I have a group in LA that I run once a month where I ha I'd share breakfast meetings of investors. I just set it up and I started running it. And then I got seen as the guy who was doing that. Um, you can do that. Anyone can do that. And you can be, e even if you don't feel you have the right skills, if you can invite six other people around the table that are CEO material, or, or if you're a, a product person and you want to have a product round table, or you're an engineer, or you're a marketing person, there's no reason you can't invite five people who do what you do and start a peer mentorship group. With regards to finding more senior mentors, yeah. um, you know, look, most people like me actually want to help people. They want to give back. You want to find ways to be meaning, meaningful and useful. The, the problem is there's just too many people approaching you, so how do you decide? And then there's just the people who are extra friendly, extra persistent. Um, they seem like they're good people and they give back and you end up just finding a way to be their mentor. So if I could tell people to follow somebody, I would say follow Rohan, right? So what is it that you've done? Uh, you write regular comments on my blog. You uh, write regular comments on Fred Wilson's blog. You obviously have gotten to know his wife. Um, you initiated a 50th birthday party card, or I can't remember, it was an anniversary or birthday card. Anniversary, yeah. Um, anniversary card. And, uh, and, you know, I see you doing these things in the community, and we kind of know each other remotely, but not intimately. And, uh, and so I see you doing all that. And so when you ask me, would you take a half hour out of your schedule to do a Skype call? And you didn't say, Mark, would you do a Skype call to help me figure out how to make more money? Would you do a Skype call um, to tell me how to get promoted? You said, would you do a Skype call so I can learn a bit from the community, uh, learn a bit, I, I can teach the community, I can get you on record, and hopefully that'll help some people. And so I'm all for that. So I probably shouldn't tell you this, but um, the fact that you've done this just makes it that much easier for you to call me again and say, Mark, I kind of have something personal I need help on. Would you help me with X? And you've already earned that right. And the way you got the Skype call was two re three reasons. One is I see what you do in the community, number one. So I assume you're a good person. Are you a good person? <laughs> uh, seem like a nice guy. Number two is... Um, uh, you were persistent, you know, you just kept asking and you were super polite about it. And I just regret that I didn't get it done two months ago. I really wanted to. Um, and, you know, persistence pays off over time. And number three is your ask was a community ask. And, and there's just so many ways to meet people uh, and to make it easy for those people and to allow those people to give back in, a, in an unselfish way. And, uh, and so I suspect that's why you're good at, uh, at networking. Thank you, Mark. I mean, you know, it's amazing how many more questions. I, I think I was too hopeful. So I'm going to get down to the final personal section, I think. Uh, you know, Let me just say that it depends upon how much time you have. I'm probably a little bit okay to overrun, but I'm okay also to cut out if you have some time. No, 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 I, I do. But I, I have, you know, I have a small personal section. I had a... I guess tech and entrepreneurship section, which I'm going to skip, and I'm going to go to something more interesting. So first will be a couple of light questions. One is, what are your favorite books, uh, and then favorite movies and TV shows? Uh, you know, where do you get? You know, what do you do in your free time? I guess, and what do you enjoy, and why? So I love reading. Um, I have a long history of liking liking um, two types of books. I either like nonfiction. And I love history and politics. Mm -hmm. 
And the second thing is I like historical fiction. Okay. So those are my two favorite. I think uh, some of my all-time favorite books, uh, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, which is Mulan Kundera. Um, one I've written about before that I really just love is um, uh, it's Philip Roth book, uh, American Pastoral. Okay. And uh, what's wonderful about American Pastoral is it's a, it's a historical you know, work of fiction that talks about entrepreneurship. And it talks about generations of families and the fabric that holds us all together. It talks about city decline and the decline of the urban environment and globalization. Um, and uh, it, it was, I mean, it won the uh, Pulitzer Prize, which is a top prize for writing in the United States. It's a wonderful book. Philip Roth is one of the best authors. I love also expanding my mind on world issues. Uh, two of the most influential nonfiction books that I ever read uh, were by the same person. His name's Jared Diamond, mm -hmm. and he wrote a book called Guns, Germs, and Steel. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that talks about the historical context of why the West became so powerful and why other places yeah. developed less power. And the second is called Collapsed. Okay. And he studied all the civilizations in the world and why they declined. And they all declined for the same reason, okay. which was uh, depletion of resources. Mm -hmm. And so he asks, you know, is that going to affect us today? And yeah. the answer is yes. It's a scary read, but it's an important read. Um, so those are just some examples of what I like to read. I'm currently listening to a book on tape. It's, uh, it's about the transition of power. Um, between uh, John F. Kennedy when he gets assassinated and Lyndon B. Johnson. Yeah. It's also, it's a wonderful story about leadership and politics and uh, political maneuvering. Uh, and there's great many lessons in it, but I'm really enjoying it. That's great. On the film side, I hate blockbusters. <laughs> I hate blockbusters. I love independent film. I love learning about different places and different cultures, so I watch a lot of international film, uh, particularly like French film. Uh, I think they do a great job. I like a lot of British film. I'll tell you one of my favorite films of all time is a film very few people know. It's called Secrets and Lies. Okay. I'm planning on writing about it at some point in time. Uh, but the lady who was in Secrets and Lies won the Oscar for it, and it's a story about the human condition. Okay. And what I mean is we all have little secrets and lies about ourselves that we don't tell other people. And there are things that we hold dear to ourselves, like I have a big fear of public speaking or um, I, I can't have children or I, you know, whatever it is, or, you know, my father was an alcoholic or whatever. None of those things are true about me, but um, <laughs> whatever secrets and lies you have, the more we hold them inside, the less happy in life we are. Mm. And the more we share our secrets and lies with others, the more we realize nobody cares. <laughs> and it's freeing. And you can be a very open, free, happy person if you don't keep secrets and lies to yourself. And it's just, it's a wonderful film by one of the greatest uh, British film director, writers and directors that there is. And I recommend it to anyone. And then finally, on TV shows, Currently, my favorite show is House of Cards, uh, Netflix, because I love politics and drama. Yeah. And uh, I'd be lying if I didn't say I love Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're huge Game of Thrones fans here. We have a board game. We have uh, we're reading the books. It's it's incredible. Okay, so, so 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 next next two questions, like last two questions, and the next one is Mark. You do a lot. You you we see you you speak to so many people. You write blog posts. What are some very practical productivity hacks that you use to keep yourself uh, moving and moving productively? Well, I know not everyone's going to like my hack, but don't answer all your email. <laughs> and I mean it truthfully, and it's one of those things, I say it in public, but people don't like to hear this. For whatever reason, I can put my mobile phone number on the internet, and very few people will call me on it because they understand that it's not okay to peer into my private life and just reach out to me on my cell phone. It's just, it's not a social norm. 
And for whatever reason, everyone believes that it's a social norm that they can write you an email and res expect a response. But I just ask you, if you're not a high volume email person to do the math, if you get just 100 emails a day, and if it takes you two minutes to read each email, and let's say you respond to 50 of them, and it takes you two minutes to respond to 50 emails each, imagine how many hours a day you are slave to email. Hours, and the yeah. problem with email is it's very reactive. It's, oh, what are all the people who want me to do something today, not what are all the things I need to do in my life today. Um, and so what I like to call email is, email is my to-do list that you get to add to. And the problem with you is that you is the world. Like any random person can just write me and they're on my to-do list and that's not okay. And I think way too many people spend way too much time as slaves to email. So what I did is I segmented my email into public and private. I have a public email address like anyone. It's pretty easy to guess and a lot of people do guess it. And the truth is I read all of them. I just don't respond to all of them. And I have an autoresponder that says, this is my public email address. Thank you very much for getting in touch. If you are someone I know close, please write me on my private email address. And if I don't know you, I will do my best to get back to you. And if I don't, uh, just write me again. Um, and then on my private email address, because it's not easily guessable, I tend to mostly only get business. And therefore, I service the, those emails with higher frequency. I, get, I respond to them better because it's not mixed in with everything else. Um, so those are some of the things that I do. Yeah, fair enough. The last question would be, what is an idea that inspires you that you would like to share? An idea that inspires you? An idea you. that inspires you. Um, I will tell you the most important thing that I think needs to be solved right now. Um, and anyone making strides to solve this problem is near and dear to me. I think it's, well, because I live in America, I will say education in America. And I mean um, education of the young masses of America. I feel like determining one's life traje trajectory in 2013 is so much determined by what you learn when you're young and everything else like your path is mostly set out for you and i feel like we do a particularly bad job in america and i think the idea that we are encouraging all these young people well first of all many of them just dropping out of school um, but then trying to get you on a track that you have to go to a four-year university, that you have to take on $50,000 of debt, I think is a travesty. Um, if you want to see a film that'll, that'll bring tears to your eyes, it's waiting it's for Superman. Superman. Yeah. yeah, and it's, it, um, I've seen it twice and I cried both times, or I didn't cry loudly. I got <laughs> um, I'm not that big a baby. So, so, but it's just, it's heartbreaking when you see families that want to educate their children that don't have the financial resources uh, to educate their children and they want to make better and they don't have the resources. So whenever I get the opportunity to give back, I try to do it through Donors Choose, which is run by a gentleman named Charles Best, who I think deserves sainthood. He is um, truly inspirational, one of a kind. Um, both the entrepreneur and, um, and you know, person who uh, does charitable acts. And, uh, you know, anything that we can do to try to figure out how to provide better education for young people is near and dear to me. And I think that the education system we have in the United States is so antiquated. It was so created for the system that existed in the 1950s, and we're perpetuating it. And I think we need to break the model. What I'm encouraged by is that parts of the model have started to break. And what I mean by that is if you're a developer in 2013, legitimately no one gives a shit where you went to college or <laughs> even if you went to college. They just don't care because there's enough tools online to evaluate yeah. uh, your skill set. Yeah. Again, like you contact me 
and you say, would you have a Skype call to talk to our community? For all I know, you dropped out of school at 12. You know, I have no idea and I don't care. Yeah. I can judge you by who you are in the community through the public uh, yeah. sphere. And unfortunately, most parts of our economy are very backwards and very conservative. So they still need to judge you based on credentials rather than judge you based on capabilities. And the more we can break down that model and judge people based on capabilities, uh, the further away we're going to get for, from creating indentured servants who graduate with debt and end up in dead-end careers and jobs. So anyway, education. I, I guess I take every short question to make a long answer. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, this is great, Mark. I, I, I think, you know, I'm pretty sure I took a lot longer than I asked for, but it was so much fun. And you know, I almost have to do a round two in a couple of years with with, with the longer with the list of questions that just seems to get longer. Th thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you so much for uh, choosing to um, you know spend your time to inspire. I think I think it makes a huge difference. And no it, problem. The the honest thank you goes to you because you've been so persistent and so uh, uh, gracious at at asking, even though I've been a struggle to get on the phone. And if there are 40 more questions that you wish you would have got to and you want to do round two, just ask. I, I will absolutely do that.